Hello and welcome to Breaking Into Hollywood Live, the master course. How are you, Mr. Goldstein? You're in a little funny mood today. Very well, Miss Davies, and how art thou? <laughs> I will be keeping my eye on you this afternoon because I'm not quite sure what you're up to. You've got that smile of a naughty yeah. boy on your face. <laughs> Some days you're like that. It's Tuesday, which means we have another fabulous guest joining us tonight. Lee Jessup, wonderful woman, the most beautiful hair in the whole world. That's one thing <laughs> I want to talk about. Um, but she's a coach to professional and emerging writers, which I'm sure is going to be very valuable information for all of you. And a question that I've just asked that I'm going to get Gary to ask, which um, has to do with that description. So Gary, let me hand over to you. Oh, before I do that, if you have any questions for Larry, um, Larry or G, no, Gary or <laughs> Lee, <laughs> throughout the show, just leave them in the comments here and we'll bring them up. So if you want any further explanation about something, if you want any advice, put them there and we will bring them up. Mr. Goldstein, over to you. Why, thank you, ma'am. And I promise to get that teleprompter fixed immediately. Um, anyway, <laughs> welcome, everybody. Great to have you here at Breaking Into Hollywood. And we do have a very special guest. It is fun tonight. Lee Jessup is with us. Hi, Lee. Hello, hello. Um, Lee, Lee's nickname is the No Nonsense Career Coach for the Scrappy Screenwriter. And if that doesn't sum it up, nothing does. Uh, so here's here's the the um, the um, pre-approved bona fides. Author of the best-selling book, Getting It Right: An Insider's Guide to a Screenwriting Career. Lee Jessup is a career coach for professional and emerging screenwriters with an exclusive focus on the screenwriter's professional development. Yes. Her clients include WGA members, Golden Globe and Emmy nominated screenwriters, writers who have sold screenplays and pitches to major studios, and contest winners. She spent six plus years as the director of uh, ScriptShark.com, and during her time with ScriptShark, she introduced hundreds, literally hundreds of screenplays to um, entertainment industry professionals, spearheaded a national business of screenwriting seminar series which was launched in partnership with Final Draft and sponsored by the New York Times Company. Uh, she's been an invited speaker at screenwriting conferences and festivals both here and abroad in Europe and elsewhere. Lee is a regular contributor to Script Magazine uh, and actually Script, Script Magazine's plural including Script Magazine and uh, yeah I got that right and was the interview subject for a number of film-centric television and web programs. And if you want to learn more about Lee, her background, her services, her family life, her pets, you go to LeeJessup.com. L and that's not Lee as in L E I G H, it's L as Lee as in L E E. Jessup as in J E S S U P. LeeJessup.com. That's where you're gonna go. So <laughs> and you're gonna go to Amazon and you're gonna look at her book, uh, Getting It Right which is a beautiful cover. We just dis discovered that. Uh, very, uh, brand new, actually a very recent, recently published book, like in April of this year. Nothing but five star reviews. Very well deserved, so go check that out as well. Lee Jessup, this is your life. Welcome. Thank you for having me. My God, it sounds uh, <laughs> it's intimidating. Like, don't, don't you now want to meet yourself? Now I have to fill those shoes, my God. I know they're big, big size fourteen <laughs> shoes. So um, I'm a let's little person. I'm five three. You know, it's a woman of great stature, nonetheless. <laughs> so, Lee, um, let let's sort of first of all, I'm thrilled you're on 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 breaking into Hollywood with us. Uh, we have thank you, had, thank you for having me. Seriously, uh, absolutely, we've had some really extraordinary. Uh, guests. I mean, with a, you know, successful people tend to be very generous spirits, and they are, by nature, mentors who want to give back. We've had extraordinary producers, actors, writers, directors, agents, different kinds of people. I'm thrilled that you're on the show because you bring a different perspective, mm -hmm. a different body of experience, which really is very laser targeted, more on career or entrepreneurship. How do you, as Bethan said before the show in the green room? How do you move from being an emerging screenwriter, and I would actually say an emerging creative, because mm -hmm. really the same ideas apply to a cinematographer or a producer. Totally agree. Um, so how do you move from um, that mindset and that reality into being a professional, i.e. you have a business of it, you have income, you have a series of relationships, you have a sustainable business, and the question is how do you become 
How do you move from being the caterpillar to the butterfly? Well, you know, it's a lot of hard, consistent work is the bottom line. A lot of writers, um, and even directors, but let's focus on writers for a moment, do tend to arrive and say, oh, I have the one script, I, want, I wrote the one script, why isn't it happening? Um, the reality of breaking into screenwriting, and we are in, in a career-driven period of time in the industry, the one-and-done model that was the 90s model of people who could emerge with a single script, sell it, and then never be heard from again, that's pretty much done because the spec market is in the shape that it's, that it's at. Um, so we're in a career-driven um, time period in, in the industry. So what it takes is really understanding what it takes, understanding that we're talking about a minimum of three to ten years of hard, consistent work, of getting out there. I, I was noting earlier, I have a client that I talked to right before um, we started, and he's out there with a television pilot, with a television concept, that he's meeting with all the big players today. There are companies with finance secured that want to invest. There's but, um, you know, we are we are in a good good place for him. But the reality is that he's been doing this since, since he's been with this particular story since 2000. Now, in that time, he's also written a bunch of other projects, made a bunch of other contacts. You never know which script is going to, to hit. So, you know, I always say that as a writer, you constantly have two pots on the fire, and you constantly have to tend to them. One is the creative pot, right? You have to constantly create new content better the content, expose the content, get notes, get inside, get people looking at the work. The other is your, st your strategic pot that you constantly have to be making efforts, outreaching to, so building networks, um, considering your brand, getting out there, attending events, getting material out there, building pedigree for your work. Those are things that have to be done consistently. The moment you stop doing them consistently, going to, from emerging to professional is much less likely. Agreed. That beautiful, beautiful setup, and it's interesting because you're really saying uh, fundamentally uh, you have to be willing to do the things that that the vast majority aren't willing to do. It's that Absolutely. sort of ten thousand hours. It's not ten thousand hours. That's a wonderful idea. I don't buy into it mathematically necessarily. It's a choice. It's 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 the decision that you make to step on that path mm -hmm. and stay on it. Um, it actually. Uh, when I hear you say it, I, I, I'm not used to hearing people say it, we're in a, 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 the era of career. We're in the, the career mode now, not the um, spec market of the 90s. Or, yeah. the, or, or when development was much more, when any given studio had three, 400 projects in active development and they bought pitches like you and I change shoes. When there were uh, development funds that dried up some yes. years ago. But, but when you think about that, it's interesting because actually it just occurred to me listening to you that the 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 the, the uh, this moment, this career-driven moment, if you will, is very much akin to how where we started. It's come full circle. It's mm -hmm. the old, it's basically the old studio system without the deals. In other words, it's that idea that you have to continually reseason yourself. You have to Absolutely. work hard. You have to turn out a, you know a few scripts a year. You have to keep that machinery oiled. And if you do so, then suddenly within three, four years, you start to gain serious traction, which is not just your, your creative bucket, but it's paralleled with your strategic bucket. Absolutely. And, and, you know, the thing that I find is that all my professional writers, whether they sold in the last year or three years ago, they all get that they have to renew themselves, as they call it, every four to six months. So that means a new script. That means something new to talk about. That means something new to reach out to people about, you know, a new series of meetings. Um, you know, a lot of it is understanding that you just have to continuously put in the hard work. You have to see it as a second job, not just, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my time and attention into the script for the next six months and then everything is going to be fine. That's just the beginning. So, you know, you really do have to keep that focus and that motivation going. And that's where I always remind people, this is not a sprint. By no stretch of the imagination is this a sprint. This is a marathon. You have to pace yourself and you have to figure out how to get still, how to remain active in year nine when you're trying to make it rather than capitalizing your energy in year one. You have to figure out how to get yourself from here to there because, frankly, you know, I have, I have somebody who's uh, writing for Universal now, 10 years. I have another writer who just got staffed on a TV show, nine years. Um, you know, nine years of consistent hard work. It's not for nothing that, you know, we all throw out these numbers. They're real numbers. That's what it takes. So I think mm -hmm. the first step is really understanding what it takes 
and understanding that you're not going to be the outlier. If you are the outlier, just pretend it's not going to happen. Um, you know, I do have one outlier. I do have one guy who showed up in May of 2013, and by December of 2013, his first feature was shot that he wrote on assignment. But that's an outlier. That is an right. exception, and I kept having to tell him, okay, understand that things are now going to go, they're going to slow down, and you're going to have to get used to the pace that everybody else is dealing with. Um, so you have those outliers, but, but I think as a writer, you really have to understand what that business model is, what it was, like you said, uh, some years ago. Of course, now the space is a lot more saturated, and we see that with the number of scripts that get registered with WGA every year. Um, you know, but also, you know, we're in a time where writers, new writers can write for TV. When, when the hell did that happen? Well, we're in a time, we, look, let's face it, when you go to medical school to become a surgeon, there are no outliers. You don't get to perform your first surgery in year three. Exactly. It, it doesn't happen. Yeah. But what, what's interesting is not only could you, could you, you know, yes, and I'm not proposing that you rely on this. You <laughs> certainly can be an exception to the rule. But by the same token, here's one thing that we do have that most people don't. We have the opportunity today, especially today, which we didn't five or ten years ago, to create our own content at a level where it really can make a difference. Absolutely. So if, you want, if you want to get noticed, which is a lot of what this thing is about, we're going to talk about this when we get more over to the strategy side. We're really mm -hmm. talking about the creative side. But the blend where, the, where those two intersect very neatly, very powerfully, is in a world today where technology is... Uh, so enabling, where costs of gear, where availability of talent, where cost quote, quote factors are so uh, non-intrusive, non, uh, they're 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 so they're manageable. Nominal. They're yeah, they're they're really they're very, very manageable, so that you can create very high quality content, which was not that easy to do up until now, with high quality behind and in front of the camera collaborators so that you can start to seed your both creative and your strategic goals at the same mm -hmm. time and get noticed. But um, so, so let's, let's just stay just for a moment with the creative side. So what, what kind of, I mean, given you've set the table, you've sort of framed out the biggest piece of the conversation. Um, I'm, 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 I'm a uh, relatively new aspiring screenwriter. Um, you know, I've written a script, I'm working on, you know, I'm polishing it, I have another idea in mind for my next project. Count, what counsel would you give me? Well, first of all, you want to expose the work early and often, right? This is, first of, first of all, the medium itself, while screenwriting can be incredibly solitary, the medium itself is collaborative. This is not a world where, you know, you write the book, you put the book out, people love it or hate it, deal with it. Somebody said to me once, well, Picasso never had to expose his work. Um, but, you know, you finish a painting, you put it on the wall. Don't really get to do that with a screenplay. So you want to expose the, world, the work early and often, get a lot of feedback from people who are professionals in the space. Um, so whether you go to known readers or consultants or a class, you want to expose the work to people who know what the hell they're talking about. And people are not going to be nice to you. People who are going to really rake you over the, call, the coals. I was talking to a client who was very excited to go to a reader who's known for being a ball buster. And good on her because you have to get people who will be tough on the work to challenge you on the work because that will bring it to the next level. Ultimately, screenwriting is a very specific and unique craft in that you are creating a blueprint and asking somebody to see a house. And so you have to make sure that you're truly delivering everything that you need to deliver in order for somebody to understand that vision of that house in your mind. Um, so certainly you want to expose the work, you want to get out there, but you also want to constantly hoard new ideas. You want to start thinking ahead to the next project because ultimately projects take time to percolate. They need to kind of organically grow within you. So if you're sending material out for notes, don't sit on your hands. Creativity begets creativity. Go start writing out new outlines, you know, broad treatments for your new next idea and start building those up. You can always go to events. You can always network with people both online and live if you're in Los Angeles. Um, equally, if you're in London, there's the London Screenwriting Festival. There's the Melbourne Organization in Australia. I mean, there's always opportunities to get out there. So you need to constantly be thinking, what can I do? What can I do smart? Where can I learn more? How do I stay exposed? Um, and keep getting yourself out there. So you want to keep working on those projects, really push them to the next level, 
remember that you only get one chance to make that first impression. You don't get to send a script out there and then six months later go, whoops, I figured out what was wrong. Can I send you a new draft? It doesn't work that way. I mean, as you know, you, you really get that kind of first time out, and that's it. All right, so you're, so, let, I'm sorry. go ahead, Bethan. That's a question. Um, you mentioned that one of the clients you're working with um, today uh, was going out and pitching something or talking about to studios about something that he wrote yeah. 14 years ago. As a creative, how do you stay interested in something that's that old? You well, know, this, I is, this is really a passion on. project for this writer. Um, you know, during this time, he managed to get uh, two movies of the week made. Um, you know, develop other relationships, but this this has really been his passion project. Um, so he's continued to chase it, and and I think it speaks to you know true love versus a fling um, in the world of writing. You know, is he truly invested in it? And he's been with this project. Uh, you know, he started in 2014, uh, in 2000. We're now in 2014. We're 14 years later, but I think it speaks to how long it can take. Sometimes, listen, a friend of mine who's a producer. Tracy Becker, um, she did Finding Neverland, was nominated for an Academy Award. Her next movie took seven years. And nobody's impressed by it when you tell them. Nobody goes, oh my god, it took seven years. How is that possible? That's the amount of time that creatives and producers and oftentimes directors live with projects. So you really have to select projects that you're excited about, that sink their teeth into you, that you can go the long distance with because that's what it's going to take. Thank Lee, what, do you have, uh, I just want to dial back for a moment, you were talking about something I, uh, you touched on a number of things, each one of which is tremendously <laughs> strategically crucial in the mindset of the writer, and it's a practice, it's a practical thing. You talked about, you know, you get one shot at a first impression. I am Ooh. big on um, certain ideas around systemizing how you uh, determine in a world that is entirely, entirely subjective. How do you determine when you're ready for prime time? When you're ready to, I'm not talking about your hand-selected inner circle of feedback counselors, you know, and that family and friends aren't allowed there. No. This is This is your, you know, your writing mentors, and this is your script consultants, and these are people who have reason to trust that they know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any kind of system, I, system approach to, how, how people should test and know that they're ready to take product to market, whether it's a script or a pitch or whatever it might be. You know, I think that you you know you work on you work on the work. You get feedback. I like my writers surrounding themselves with people who are prone to hate the work. I think it's just that much more challenging. Um, you know, you you decide on who you're going to go to, who you're going to get notes from, get notes from strangers with good reputations, people who are not rooting for you, people who are not in your corner, people that don't have a reason. Say, oh well. He tried so hard, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it slide. Um, but you go to enough of those where you feel, you know, I've delivered what I've wanted to deliver with this work. You understand some people will get it, some people won't get it. Whenever a client of mine comes in and says, okay, the project's ready, my question is always, are you okay being rejected on this work? Meaning, if this is the work that you get out there and people go, oh, well, I, I don't get it, or it sucks, or I can't believe you did that, are you okay with, clearly you don't want the rejection, but are you secure enough in the material itself to say, yeah, I can, I can handle that because I know I've done everything that I can to deliver the material that I want to deliver, be it in a fully realized script, be it in a pitch, be it, be it with you know, an elaborate deck, whatever it is the writer is delivering. Um, you know, most times writers will tell you f the first few times out, oh, yeah, of course I'm ready. And then the first rejection will come in and they'll go, oh, no, what do I change now? Um, so it really is about gauging that confidence and, and also getting to that understanding of you've gotten enough notes, there's enough people who've gotten it. It's important there are people who get it. If there's nobody who gets it in your inner circle or a circle of consultants and readers that you're paying, nobody's going to get it beyond that circle either. If you have enough people who get it, if you feel that you find three or four people who don't have to like the work, who do like the work and say, okay, there's something there, then you can take that gamble of I'm going to gamble, I'm going to bet that I'm going to find the person, the professional person who can do something with this, who's going to like it. And the reality is that every successful project in, in this industry was passed on somewhere. Um, you know, Wedding Crashers I, was passed on by every I, studio in town. I mean, it's you know this. I've never had a script passed on. I have no yes, idea what you're talking about. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's not so much about finding the people who will 
who will pass on the work as much as, you know, it's finding the people who love the work um, and having the faith that the material is close enough. And, and, you know, Matthew, the client I was mentioning earlier, there's a perfect example. He's been chasing this dream for 14 years. Granted, the television climate has really changed during this time. But he knew there's something there. He's always known there's something there. He's vetted it like nobody's business. He's exposed the work. Enough people got it so that when he got into the professional space, doors started to open like crazy. All right. And also, let's just be clear. When, when you say people get it, I mean, in, you know, like getting it is they actually endorse it. Yeah. In the sense that you've told a tale that has moved me, it's got a beginning, a middle, and end, it's got characters that actors yeah. will want to portray, and a filmmaker will see it visually, and all of that. So we're talking at a certain level. And also, if you give it to 10 people that are hand-selected, uh, uh, people you trust to give you feedback, and as you say, they're not all close friends, they have an objective stand, yeah. Yeah. Um, that if all 10 um, give you criticism, which everyone should, by the way. Absolutely. Um, even if they love it, they should give you criticism. Even if they give you criticism, as long as if those criticisms are a little bit all over the map, you're better off than if all ten pick the same. You know, yeah. I don't. You know, this second act is a mess. If they all say that, it's a mess. Trust me. You're in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a big, a big problem. But you make me laugh because you talk about the. Uh, anyway, everybody should pray for rejection. I mean, I'm sorry. Absolutely. I just let's, let's just tell it like it is. But I love that you know when you talk about the reaction of the writer who sends it out for the very first time and it gets rejected. They said, "Yeah, I don't mind being rejected." The first rejection comes and they run. It's like, oh my god. Yeah. The only thing worse than that, and I gotta say it because it happens all the time, is the writer who thinks it's ready. They somehow get invited by. Um, an executive or a producer or an agent or someone they deem potentially very important or relevant to their career to request and say, yes, I'd love to read your script. And the next thing they do is they, like a mole, uh, what are the animals that go into underground? The moles. Uh, <laughs> they, they mole their way down, bunker down and say, okay, okay, it'll just take me three white weeks, i got to do a rewrite. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They yeah. suddenly decide it's not ready yeah. and they make someone wait weeks. And in this town, weeks might as well be eons. Oh, absolutely. Uh, because you're now forgotten and, and every day there's another dozen scripts and conversations and meetings. Oh, yeah. um, so, you, you know, it's, it's very funny. But, you, but you know, you go with your guns. If you've done your homework and you've tested, 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 and you've trusted, got trusted people giving it, and you've really taken it to heart and figured it out, then yes, when it's time to go, expect a lot of rejection and pray for it. Absolutely, because listen. If, if everybody said yes, you couldn't take them seriously. Yeah, and, and the truth of the matter is that I find that good work, when good work gets out there, even if it's not a fit, it starts to move on its own a little bit. There's a little bit of, oh, it's not for me, but let me hand it over to somebody else. Everybody wants to look good for discovering a great script. You yeah, know, I have... Here, people start to talk about it behind your back. They say, here's, I liked it. It's not for our company for this reason, but, you know, this was kind of interesting. You might yeah. want to take a look. Absolutely. Or at least sit down with you and say, what else are you developing? This is not for me, but what else are you working on? Because I really like your style. I really like what you're writing. This is not for us. We just did something like this where, you know, we have something like that in development. It's darker than what we usually do, but I really like your voice, so let's sit down and talk. Most writers ignore the fact that if, if it's an out-and-out -out rejection, this is not for us, okay. best of luck in the future, you know, so, conversation's so, done. So now, Lee, you're tapping into my ver ver very favorite theme of all time, uh, which is that relationships trump results, that this is not a game, uh, this is a long-term strategic game of relationship yeah. building. If, if you want to get to that three to ten year, wherever it is, if you want to get to that place where you have a real, what we would call a career, a sustainable business, and it's supported by a network of quality relationships that bring the opportunity, that talk about you when you're not in the room, all of those kinds of things. So when you go into a room, literally or metaphorically, maybe it's a submission, maybe it's over the phone, maybe you're physically in a room, what have maybe you. Maybe it's a Skype call, maybe, whatever it is. Whatever it is, then uh, let's talk for a moment. I'd love your, you know, what, what's the, what, what are the out various possible outcomes and what should your mindset and goal be to come away from that meeting with? Well, the thing is that, you know, a lot of writers go into the room with this, I want to sell my project, which is so highly unrealistic. You know, I want to walk out with a check. It's a highly unrealistic perspective. And, and even if, if we take it a step back and we look at pitch events, right, 
we look at those sorts of things. Those are not pitching opportunities. They're networking opportunities. What you want to get from the executive is them saying, I want to read your next thing. Send me the next thing when you have it. If I read what, what you already have and I like it, send me your next thing. Here's some things that we're working on. What do you think about yada yada? You want to start the conversation. You want to build a relationship. You want to, in six months, be able to reach out and say, hey, can we grab a coffee? I just finished a script and a place in a contest, and I'd love to pick your brain. But the way to get those yeses is to compel, first of all, with your writing. Secondly, with your business etiquette. Um, and with consistent efforts. But what you're looking for from those meetings is continuity. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for, to have somebody who will be there in your corner for years to come until you have the right project. The likelihood of the right project meeting the right person is so unlikely. It does happen, but it doesn't happen often. Look at where we are with the spec market as it is this year. We're up to what? 47, 48 spec sales, we're not moving a lot of property right now. So what does that mean? That means that when you're in the room, you want to build that relationship. You want to create continuity. You want to cre create future opportunity for the next project and the next project and the next project because that becomes your fan base. That becomes your network that sooner or later will hopefully get in your corner and help you make things happen. Can I jump in here with a question that relates to... Um uh, writing spec scripts. Elena has asked, how much time should you devote between writing specs treatments and writing a full private feature? Based on what you just talked about there, what would be your, your advice there, Lee? Well, it really varies. I, you know, let's talk TV versus film for a second. I like to see my feature writers churn in uh, two full scripts a year. I find the treatments are really tough to move specifically from new writers, unless you have those contacts, unless your agent can get you in the room to pitch, you really need that fully realized screenplay. Um, you know, so I, I like to see my writers finish and get ready for market two scripts a year. And I think that's the velocity, the velocity that, that a feature writer wants to get on, four to six months. That's, that's the time span because ultimately, if you're not repped right now, by the time you have an agent, you're going to be competing. You're going to com be competing with their existing clients for attention. You're going to be comp competing with potential new clients for attention. You have to stay front of mind. And the only way to stay front of mind, really, is that content. Now, on the TV front, you know, there is the reality of fellowships, which is a great way into TV. But ultimately, it's a very, it's a lottery. So you have to allocate a limited amount of time to doing it. I usually ask my writers who are pursuing fellowships to spec for two months out of the year. Usually it's January, February, February, March. Um, get those specs out of the way and then go to pilot. And ultimately when you're writing for TV, your velocity has to be that much faster. There are some who like to outline and then create a really robust deck to go along with the material. But again, you have to have a way in uh, to present that deck. Nobody's just going to look at a deck to look at a deck. And when I'm talking about a deck, uh, to those who are, who are not familiar, we're talking about a very expensive um, PowerPoint presentation that details the series, the world, the characters, the pilot, where we're going with this thing, a bit of a Bible. Um, but unless you have a way into the industry, most people won't look at a deck, they'll look at a pilot. So ultimately, you want to get to a place where you can outline a pilot in a, in a month, two months, and then finish writing the first draft in another month and work on your velocity because ultimately you get into fellowships, you're lucky enough to sell a pilot to get in a room to, to go out for staffing, you're going to have to churn out material very, very quickly. You don't have the luxury um, ultimately to be in a place where you're taking a year to write a pilot. It's okay for your first pilot or your second pilot, but then you have to really start planning for velocity and that's when time planning and deadlines are really, really important. You don't have the luxury to get into a room and say, holy shit, it used to take me a year to write a pilot, now I have to write an episode in two weeks or three weeks. Well, listen, some of these, some of these fellowships that you're referring to, uh, it's an application process and mm -hmm. All uh, of them are. A, lot, a lot of people uh, vying for those few slots. Yeah, and, and it's I've a lottery. Seen, yeah, and I've seen uh, situations where people say, you know, we really like you, you're still in the running. But we need you to turn in a new script. It's not a pilot. Just do an episode of X, one oh, yeah. of our properties. Do one of our properties, and you've got three days to turn it around. One so, of my clients last year, that was her experience. You have three days from here to, I think she got in on a Monday. There was between her and another writer, and they said, we want to see what you're doing with this, ep with this particular material. Go home, write an episode. And the reality is that that's not that far from the room experience. 
Um, you know, I have writers in rooms all over town, and they're turning in material rather quickly. Yeah, that's that's the world of TV. It's a totally different yeah. rhythm, uh, and um, it's it's astonishing to me. And then you see these writers, the Genji Cones, or the, there's a lot of them who write virtually every script they shoot that season. And you <laughs> yeah. Think, oh my God, these are not human beings. That's no, insane. I don't know what I don't know what they are. It's uh, hours and hours of content that they're managing to create flawlessly at that. How how many, how many pitches when a feature writer, for example, is working on whatever it is their current project? Mm -hmm. um, they've they've got one hopefully that's being being shopped in the marketplace or that they're sending out, and they've got another one that they're working on. I, I always tell people always be prepared for the the one question that seems to be one of the most frequently often asked questions in exactly our industry. What say. say it. What else do you have? <laughs> what, else, what, what else? What else you got? I see the salami. I see the bologna. What else you got? <laughs> exactly. Uh, right. So, That's the uh, most prevalent question in the industry. There's. It is. It is because we are question. we are a community of people who thrive and and exist solely in in the quest for that great new gem, that diamond, that pearl, that something that's going to light up the universe and make our career and make getting up in the morning an exciting event. Uh, and so, that being the case, and it's true for everybody, by the way, all of us except for the writers, we are all 100% unemployable and unemployed, um, <laughs> but for the existence of the writer. So, yeah. you know, the writers don't necessarily, we, we're not supposed to say that to the writers, I know. Okay, but that being the case, whether it's an executive, whether it's a representative, whether it's a producer, whatever it might be, a filmmaker, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. When someone asked that time-honored question, what, how many, how many should, should a writer generally, is there a gen, can we generalize and say a writer should have two pitches at the ready that are, that are really pitchable? I always want my writers to have five projects they're ready to talk about that are not written yet. So that means to me that there's an outline somewhere that they've worked through the pitch, that they, they're ready to walk into the room and talk about it. If they were told, oh my god, this is the greatest thing, go write it tomorrow, they have an understanding of what they're going to write. Um, I had somebody going to pitch Happy Madison last year, and he developed some ideas, but they were really vague, and ultimately I said, okay, let's meet before and just make sure that we know what we have. He said, no, 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 I'm fine. I roped him into the meeting, and he walked in, and he said, oh, I have this one great idea, and he starts pitching it, he didn't think it through. It was a first act. It wasn't a movie. He couldn't pitch it because he didn't know where the movie was going. But that's why we practice those things. That's why every idea that you talk about have an outline somewhere. It can be a broad outline, but understand the structure of this thing. Understand where it's going. Understand how it fits into three acts or how it translates into a series. I like to have five ideas, three ideas in brand, two ideas out of brand. Um, and, you know, ideas whoa, can... Whoa, whoa, back up. Back up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love when you speak Sanskrit. I want, I want you to describe three in brand, two out of brand, please. So three ideas that are logical follow-ups to what put you in the room in the first place. Uh, you know, if it's a great comedy script, you want to have three more really strong comedy ideas. Um, they can run the gamut of comedy, so it can go from family comedy to dark right. comedy, whatever. But three strong comedy ideas. And then you want to have those two ideas that are that are out of brand, that are a little bit out of the box, um, you know. And most writers have those because my, most writers hate to be branded, but it's part of the reality of the business. Somebody's going to brand you. You might as well do that to yourself. Um, so you know, if you have those couple of thriller ideas, but you're a comedy writer, let's talk about those. Let's talk about your ability to think outside of the box. I had a writer go in to meet with an agent of Paradigm, comedy writer, pitched him. Um, a bunch of comedy work, and he said to her, oh, well, do you happen to have a thriller? Because that's really what I'm moving today, and she just so happened to have two thriller ideas that she thoroughly vetted before walking into the room, so she did ultimately get signed. The, re the rep really loved her writing, um, you know, but that's where you want to be able to speak to your brand, but also show the potential for diversification, should that be needed. Brilliant. Yeah, agreed. You don't want all your eggs in one literal no. basket, genre or otherwise. Yes. You want to be able. You want to be able to give whoever's sitting on the other side of the table something they can sell you with. So clarity about your brand is also clarity about your genre, and you want to be able to deliver that because if you sit down and you say, "I have a cancer family drama, uh, you know, a sex co a sex comedy, and 
you know, horror script, they're literally going to go, huh? Call me when you have the next one, and we'll see where that fits in. Um, how are they going to sell you? What are they going to promote you as? Are they going to, you know, are they going to call their buddy at Lionsgate and say, I have this guy who's a great horror writer? How do they know that you can do that again? Um, so you want to have those things, those, those kind of pillars in place that strengthen the brand, but when you're talking to people, you also want to show that you're able to diversify beyond your current understanding of what it is that you have to do, which is your brand. Yeah, which is absolutely, um, and, and, it, and it's often good to sort of frame that up as the writer yeah. in the room. And say, look, this is, this is what I normally do, it's what yeah. I'm inclined to do, but I have this penchant, and here's why. You personalize it, you tell the story of how that became fascinating to you, and then you absolutely right off to the races. Here's what I write, but I had this crazy idea. There's this thing I've been dying to write. Here's what it is. My mother told me the story, and I went to a place, and I saw a thing, and it has to be a script. Right. And I've researched it, and I'm obsessed with it. Yeah. And crazy as it may sound, this is the – and it, it's fun to surprise people. Absolutely. And people want to see, you know, what are you doing? On one end, they want to see you doing the smart thing. So are you branding? Are you staying within a brand so that they can do something with you? But are you thinking bigger? Are you constantly evolving and exploring? And it's this really interesting tightrope that you have to walk, right? Because on one end, you have to compel the listener with a brand. You have clarity about what you're doing. You understand how the industry happens. You know everybody's going to brand you. You know you're going to have to get the industry to trust you for doing something very successfully. But are you thinking bigger? Are you giving yourself other opportunities while still adhering to the requirements of the industry? And I, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting little dance that that writers do. So, Speaking of dances, can I throw in a question from the audience? Please. Please. Okay, we've got Nikki here. She's at work, so can't ask his, herself live at the moment. She's moving to California in two weeks and wants to jump off on the right foot. As a screenwriter, what would be the two most important things she should do? Um, gosh, I have so many questions to ask you, Nikki, to, to help you prepare for that, but. Um, first of all, make sure that your work is vetted. Make sure that your work is as ready to go as can be. Secondly, start getting out there. Um, you know, you want, you want to be ready to talk about the work. So you want to have your log line and your pitch ready. And we're talking about an elevator pitch. We're talking about the ability to go to a mixer and just talk about your work, talk about who you are as a writer. Um, but you want to really start connecting with the organizations here that are active for writers. So. The Writing Pad, uh, WGA Foundation, um, ATES, which is Emmys, um, they do a lot of events. Writers Junction in Santa Monica. You want to hook up with the teachers that do mixers. So there's Script Writers Network. Jen Grisanti does drinks night with them every first Friday. You want to really get out there um, and do kind of the legwork to figure out what's happening work where before you get there. So get the work as tight as can be. Don't take any shortcuts there and really start capitalizing on the opportunity of being here and building a writer's community with other people who are in the same boat who have knowledge to share with you who can be instructive and instrumental to your success. Wonderful. Thank you. But I will say that I'm really, really thrilled to hear that Nikki is moving to California because you know, while it is certainly possible to succeed from elsewhere, there is an intangible about being here that goes such a long way for the writers who do make the decision to come over. And, and I would suggest that one of them is, is proximity to the writers who've made a, a conscious decision to be amongst other writers. And Absolutely. Network, uh, in proximity to one another because you learn with and from one another faster than on your own. Completely. Um, there are writers groups everywhere. There are writer events. I mean, I was at a mixer on Thursday night. There's another event that I'm not going to tomorrow night. Uh, but these things are happening all the time. Yeah. You're me meeting writers, you're growing your community, and that's just, that continues and it's, to bounce. It's, avail it's available everywhere. It's in Seattle, it's in Dallas, it's oh, everywhere. completely. It's, it's just the diversity and frequency and, and, and variety that's available here. Exactly. So w when you talk about getting out there, so let's talk about not only in terms of these, um, these associations, organizations, mixers, what have you, um, uh, like, like Writers Junction, et cetera, but... Uh, whether it's online, whether it is picking up a phone, what are some of the strategies? Uh, I, and let's let's define a little bit. So specifically, I'm thinking about the you know the the professionally younger writer who, like a, a Nikki, has moved here uh, or they live here, 
and they have a couple of three scripts. They're not represented. They have another couple of ideas that they're toying with. We've talked about the creative side. What is their what 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 does their landscape look like on a daily practice basis for getting out there and reaching out and creating some connective tissue or relationship? Well, in an odd way, you know, as much as as the industry seems impenetrable when you look from far away, I'm finding that this is a time because of the internet that it's easier to connect with industry executives than it's ever been, so long as you know where to look. And so long as you do the, the legwork to show up prepared, right? Luck, luck mm -hmm. favors the prepared, so I'm big on preparation. Um, you know, there are, you know, first of all, great avenues to creating pedigree for your work. It used to be just, you know, win a contest and then all the doors will open. Um, we have a lot more than that going on today. We have contests, we have fellowships, and then we have listing services. If you get an aid from the blacklist, that certainly is a door opener. If you get qualified on the spec scout, that's a door opener. The industry is kind of like the mafia, as you know this. We need somebody to vouch for you. So you want to do the work to get, to get the pedigree created for your work. So you're not just, hi, I'm the comedy writer who just moved into town, but rather, hi, I made semifinals at the Nickel, or I got an eight from the Blacklist, or Spec Scout just scouted my screenplay, or, or, or. Um, so you want to certainly have that pedigree, but then you have more and more do doors to knock on. Because the internet made us as accessible as it has, you know, Stage 32 is now having online pitching. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Um, they're doing online sure. pitching daily. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, Yes, it costs money. Yes, it's it's not cheap, but it's available. Um, Hollywood Pitch Fest is doing two online pitch events a year. Um, outside of events that you can go to and panels that you can go to, um, you know, you have this opportunity to really get face time with these people and start building those relationships. Um, so, you know, certainly you can query, and certainly you want to start cultivating all the connections that you've made. I love Excel. Excel my best friend. I spend way too much time on Excel daily and ask my clients to do the same when tracking information, who they met, where, what they've done. Um, but you know, there's so many opportunities today, um, starting with these online pitching avenues all the way through to Greenlight My Movie, which is a recorded pitch, uh, Virtual Pitch Fest, which is a glorified query service um, with a business model that makes sense, which is executives are paid to respond rather than to open, so they generally respond because that's what they get paid for. Um, but I really like this uh, online pitching opportunities because it's something that wasn't available a year ago. I do feel it's changing the landscape. It's something that you can do in a very practiced manner. It is live. Um, and it's a way to start building relationships. And again, you and I both spoke to the fact that in this, in this day and age where we are, it really is all about building relationships. It is all about that network. It is all about those connections. So spending you know, 10 minutes on Skype with somebody is a way to start building relationships. And ultimately, I've had more writers get signed through online pitches in the last year than any other method. And I, I have friends who are in representation who've signed clients that way and find it to be a really effective way to find writers. You know, certainly if you're in town, you can go to live pitch events and you can go to panels and there's a lot of that stuff going on. But there's actually, if you know where to look, there's more opportunities than ever before, which is completely counterintuitive. Yeah. It's one of the great secrets because everyone thinks you have to go to the agent in person, uh, which is great if you can, by the way. Um, if you have that introduction, if you have that way yeah. in, fantastic. It, yeah, and 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 and, the, and it's actually easier than than most people would believe because if they have a if you have a strategic mind um, and you're very transparent about it, there's there's no hiding the agenda, right? So right. it's like when I'm talking to Lee Jessup, I know that you have this wide and deep Rolodex. You have been a part of this industry for a time, for all uh, well, you're 17, so maybe only two years. <laughs> um, <laughs> But that said, you know a lot of people, and the warmest introduction, the warmest way to open a door and be welcomed is the referral. That said, Absolutely. You know, it's okay for me to ask you, you know, who do you admire, who do you respect, yeah. and uh, that sort of thing. But this online component, which has just blossomed uh, in recent years, um, there's tons of a fade in. There's so many of them. Oh, yeah. No, it's um, huge. It's huge. But... I agree with you that there's a really great way to, you know, when you talk to people who are in the industry or in the know, who do you think would be a good fit for me? You're not asking that person to pick up the phone. You're just saying, who do you think would be a good fit? And, and I think that if 
somebody calls in and says, you know, I talked to Gary Goldstein and he thought that you would be a great fit for me. You're going to get that attention because you're a respected name. Naturally, there there's going to be an understanding that the writer has done the legwork. Um, you know, so I completely agree with you about not need not needing the big ask, the, the small ask, right. the small questions. Right. Yeah, they've um, qualified themselves. They've shown yeah. that they're a pro. They're smart yeah. enough. Have gotten in a conversation with Lee or Gary or someone. They're not misspeaking and saying, you know, uh, yeah, they recommended that I do this. They they're suggested just, I call you. It's just the, the just the truth, right? Yeah. They they spoke very highly of you, and um, you know we we had a great conversation, and I that was the one of the great pearls I took away from the conversation. That's why I'm on the phone with you now. Great. And a lot of writers forget that what they're saying when they say this, they're saying, I understand how this industry works. I know the people who are within this industry as opposed to people who mean nothing to this industry and I'm going to be savvy and scrappy about getting myself out there and using whatever little I have to build those inroads. There's nothing as attractive to a, represent a prospective representative as someone who self-represents. Absolutely. Act activist on their own behalf. Absolutely. Uh, and that whole thing about pitching, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if writers, you know, they should, it's sort of self-evident. But it's worth saying and underscoring uh, that nothing bespeaks personality and presence in a room like personality and presence on a phone or in a room or on a Skype call. Oh, if yeah. they see that you're comfortable and a great storyteller and you're going to reflect well uh, inside the four walls they put you inside, um, that's a, uh, just an enormous advantage. Yeah, listen, I have a writer who recently got signed by you know a nice mid-level agency and when she walked out of the meeting, the agent said to her, we know exactly how to sell you. You're the tough chick who writes guy stuff. This is her. They got her. She walked in with her little motorcycle helmet. Um, but they got her. They, they got her presence. They got what she's into. They understood their job. It was a done deal. So yeah. I think it, it does go a long way to present, re represent yourself and present yourself well with clarity about who you are, what you bring to the table. Right, and it's a lot more than the script or the project because really what you're describing is so crucial. It's create an experience that makes you memorable and in turn makes you pitchable from the representative's perspective. Absolutely. People get in business with other people. They don't get in business with a script. Can I throw in another question, please? Please. Okay, we've got Terry here. It's a long, I'm going to have to read it from the... Um, from the computer. Any words of wisdom to the writer of period scripts? I placed my stories in 1415, 1599, 1797, 1906, and 1907. I have a successful period set designer who has attached herself to all of my period scripts because she says I can feel the past and bring light, bring it to light. Not that I can't write a contemporary story, but I've been hired to do a rewrite on one of these right now. But I understand that selling period scripts because of the added costs are harder to sell. Any advice? Well, I generally, I think that, that I'll, look, I'll look at my friend Tracy's movie, Hysteria. When that script went around, everybody talked about the movie about the invention of the vibrator. Nobody talked about what year it took place, Victorian England. That was, that was all superfluous stuff. Ultimately, it was, you know, about a bunch of women getting off. And that was what opened the door for that script. So I think it's really important to approach your work as, first and foremost, what story is this about? What, what is the important, the heart of the material? What is the, the thing that we're all going to walk away from before you look at it as a period piece? Period is having a much easier time on television right now than it is on screen. Um, we have you know everything from Masters of Sex to The Nick to Outlander, just the list goes on and on. Um, but if you are dedicated to film, certainly you want to first of all make sure the story really stands out. Um, you'll always get the question, can you update it? Does it have to be 1907? Can it be today? If not, then be really clear about why not and be clear about the heart of the story. Be clear about what is it, what is the story that you are really passionate to tell that just so has to, to take place in 1907. Gary, what are your thoughts on this? You know, I, first of all, I don't, I don't really like opening a conversation with an apology, which is, I have a period piece. Totally agree with you. Um, so it reminds me of a conversation when, when years ago, when Peter Goober was still running uh, Sony Pictures, 
And Magic Johnson came in for a meeting, brought his, uh, the head of a, a, his CFO or somebody, I forget. So there is Peter Gruber with two guys, Magic Johnson and his partner. And Magic Johnson's agenda, after a lot of small, you know, fun talk, was to pitch Peter on building, co-venturing to build theaters in a certain area, region. Yes. Here's how I've he pitched that. it. Okay, but that's not relevant. What's relevant is how he told the story. Yep. He pitched it by saying, Peter, imagine, I'm going to tell you a true story. Imagine a place, a country, where the population goes to the theater five times more than any of your statistics would suggest in the United States. Imagine a place, blah, 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 blah. And he just, he, he, and Peter was like, oh my God. I don't know where this place on earth is. I don't know where this country exists, but wherever it is, let me roll up my sleeves because we're about to go into the theater construction business. Where are you describing? And he said, 40 minute drive from here. Where yep. the Magic Johnson theaters now exist. Um, and, and Peter bought into it a thousand percent. But if he had walked into the room and said, hey, Peter, you want to spend... Uh, a good billion dollars building some structures to movie houses in uh, uh, what's that neighborhood? What do we call that? What's the name South of South Central? No, it's not South Central. It's not South Central. Uh, I, I anyway. I, it's I'm, somewhere south. It's let's say south. It's in the Southland. Um, uh, you know, it might not have been a very compelling or persuasive way to open that story and yes. get sign off, right? To get that guy to sign on to. It's like, oh my God, I want to go there. Where is it? He had to ask now. Yeah. So the same thing with the period piece. Like, I don't care that, do you really, the per, who, who did the King's speech? Whoever it was, I doubt that they started that pitch with, let me tell you a period piece. What they did was they told an undeniable, irresistible, delicious, textured, layered, amazing, like, oh my God, I don't believe this story, story about a real person, mm -hmm. true story. Um, and that sort of arc, that character arc, that is yep. so compelling. And at the end, you could, you, I mean, you can tell that as a present day story, or no one would know the difference. You just tell the story, and then it turns out it was, by the way, this happened to be the King of England. I'm talking about, you know, so and so in the year so and so. Yeah. It at some point, the fact that it's period becomes not irrelevant, secondary, but more of a creative consideration than a um, than an obstacle. Yeah. Agreed. Entirely agreed. So okay. if you're talking about a picture in 1906, 1907, I'm going to guess you're talking about the earthquake in San Francisco. I don't know. But that, would be a, that might be a good guess. And if that's true, just tell me an amazing story about what happened. And don't lead in with a heavy-handed, you know, this is 1906, we have to recreate the cars and the streets and the buildings and the dress and the look and the... the, the, the that's all doable. Yeah. I've got another good one here. I, this is really applicable to many of the people. Um, you mentioned events earlier. Alethea, hello. Could you recommend a networking strategy to use at a film festival? For example, how do we choose which events to attend and how to network at a film festival? To me, I'm hearing that as I'm not a real outgoing person, but I want to meet people. What is the best way of doing that? Well, first of all, start meeting the people who are sitting right next to you. Uh, remember that most people do tend to be alone at these events um, or have just wrangled a friend to go with them. If you can bring a friend with you to give you a little bit of confidence, that's great. Um, but ultimately, you want to get the conversation started without too much alcohol. Um, you know, the big mistake is people who show up and go, oh, I got a drink. I, I have to have five drinks and then I'll be fine. And then, of course, either they don't remember anything or they embarrass themselves or any number of things. Um, so you really want to, first of all, go to listen to events, listen to speakers um, who are talking about material that interests you, talking about things that are of interest. You have to remember that most of these speakers are there because they are generous with their time. They want to be there. They have something to contribute. Very, people, very few people will show up and say, ah, I don't want to be here and I hate this and why am I here? If, if they hate this, they're not going to do it. This is not a very polite industry where people just do something to be nice. Mm. Um, you know, I have one of my clients met Glenn Mazzara at, um, at a panel that he did and went and talked to him after and now they go to coffee regularly and he looks at all her work 
and you know it's it's not it's not a romantic thing it's not anything like that she's an older lady she's fantastic and talented but she made a friend um, and so it really is about focusing in on the people that you want to meet you want to talk to um, thinking if there's something that you want to say to them what is it that you want to say to them trying to collect information so that you can just say thank you later send a handwritten card send an email saying thank you so much for your time this thing that you said really resonated with me you'll be surprised how many times you'll hear back from somebody who will say thank you so much for that and the conversation will begin so it's a lot less so about doing the work there and being one of the million people who's trying to shake somebody's hand though certainly that can be helpful it is about remembering what matter to you about what somebody had to say and then reaching out to them after and saying thank you for your time thank you for this thing that you said it really resonated with me just wanted to say that I promise you there will be time that they will reach back out to you um, because ultimately they're contributing information they know that they are and they're there because they want something to resonate uh, so certainly always be sure to connect with the other people in the audience to talk to other people everybody there is is trying to build a community is trying to get to know other people but really think about the people that you want to hear speaking if you're not comfortable going up to them reach out to them later make sure that you pursue those um, all the way through okay, thank you and I, I would I add to that that's brilliant thank you and I would add to that that um, you know it's imp try as you might not to look at that scenario that situation that environment through the filter of your story. Think of it as uh, an equal opportunity engagement. Um, the people who show up, as Lee suggested, do it because they actually care about the conversation and sharing and having this sort of exchange. That's the type of person who shows up to give talks. Um, and, and, and by the way, when you're collecting information, if it's not the speaker, you're going to remember the speaker. And mm -hmm. always try to get their contact, get their email or their address, or say, you know, unashamedly, I'd love to send you a note or an article or something of interest, and and try and find any excuse legitimately, and then do what you say, of course, to get there, uh, so you can stay in touch because friendships are born exactly out of such simplicity. Exactly. Um, when when um, and and t and you never know who who's sitting next to you, as Lee says. So you know. When I'm up there, if I'm by myself, I, I like going by myself because then I can sit at any table. I see a spare seat. Do you mind if I join you? And sometimes, by the way, it's worked out blissfully well, so beyond any expectation. And sometimes it's been really <laughs> not so good, and that's okay. It's like a batting average, I guess. Yeah, it's part of the but, deal. But but the you know I uh, Lee, were you, I don't know if you were at um, the last um, Great American Screenwriting Conference in Pittsburgh. Yep. Okay, yep. so. Um, I uh, I was there, and at one point, I noticed that uh, Doc Wyatt and his partner, the guys who produced uh, uh, Napoleon Dynamite, mm -hmm. were going to give a talk, and it was in. Uh, so I found out which of the auditoriums it was in, and I walk over there before it starts, ten minutes before it's supposed to start, and the room is pretty much filling up, and Doc Wyatt's up on the day, sitting, and he's by himself. His partner has 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 not yet arrived. And I looked at this room and I went, oh my gosh. <laughs> there, you know, there were 150, I don't know, 125 people in this room, more coming in, 10 minutes to go to, 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 to prime time. And here's this guy sitting up there by himself who cares enough that he shows up to talk to these people. And he's by himself. And he doesn't so, know where to look, right? He's like, I'm going to pull out my so, phone. I'm going to. So, no, he's sitting there. He's just like, I don't know. He's gazing, whatever. So I walk right through the sea of people, right up. I jump up on the dais. I stick my mitt out. And I say, Doc, I'm Gary Goldstein. It's so great to meet you. I'm excited to hear you speak. By the way, blah, blah, blah. And then the next thing you know, it's 10 minutes later. His partners come in, sat down. They're ready to go. And we're like exchanging information. Like, this is so yeah. cool. Can't wait to talk. And because. It's the old thing about the college professor that everyone thinks, oh, I can't go visit the college professor. And the college professor sitting there saying, I wish someone would come visit me. Yeah, and the thing is that everybody who's up on that podium, everybody who's sitting behind that desk, they were once where everybody who's starting out is now. They were there. They know what it's like. Very few people had success handed to them. Most of those don't make big, big speeches. So, 
they remember and they empathize and that's why they're there. So I think that if you break through that and do just what you did, it goes a really long way. It's, it really resonates and it builds relationships. And by the way, as between you and the person sitting on the stage, the only one who thinks that they've really arrived and they, they, they live in the pantheon of deities is you. They don't oh, yeah. think that. No. <laughs> Gary, we've had Lee for an hour. We need to wrap it up. Lee, how, oh. can, people get, how can people get a hold of you? This is a uh, three. This is a three-hour show tonight. It could be, yes. <laughs> um, my, my website is, uh, you know, where I live and breathe, leejessup.com. Um, my email is lee at leejessup.com. So really wow. easy. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's where you find me. Fantastic. So, so now, Gary, I've got to tell right. you that. I've got to tell you that. You guys, you're gonna love this. You're gonna absolutely love this. Hold on a second. Gary is obviously a mind reader, and he knows his history, especially of his former habitat, habitat, San Francisco. Indeed, the sequel from my 1906 script is the San Francisco earthquake. Examples like this is why I consider Gary W. the most intelligent player in the complex film industry. Damn. <laughs> that is quite the endorsement. How okay. do you finish, not finish on that, huh? Yeah. yeah, going out on a high note. I love that. Thank you, Terry Herbert. Um, uh, anyway, Lee, this is absolutely, and by the way, her, her URL is right there. Everybody write that down, and there's a contact form there, and it's lee at leejessup.com. Uh, lee, these, uh, the, these uh, shows are, you know, the things that you have forgotten other people are hungry to learn, right? That's the, uh, you know, this value, this knowledge, this counsel that you offer is so profoundly welcome, and I thank oh, you. Thank you. Um, and this is just, you know, we have a good group on tonight, I see, but this is now going to be also then have a long life, shelf life. And I'm honored. Listen, I'm, I'm very lucky to do what I do. I think it's, it's a very unique position to be in that people turn to you and say, help me. Um, so I, I consider that to be quite humbling and, and myself to be very fortunate. And, and also, I'm really lucky to have spent the evening with you guys. It's such a blast. Well, I think you're going to get a lot of emails having given you your address out, so I <laughs> look forward to that. That's why I'm here. Great. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the good news. And um, so I really appreciate it because for those who are listening or watching, um, Lee and I have crossed paths. I don't know. We're both part of this, uh, I forget what we call it, some tele-summit that Sean told us in the Dream, the Dream Career, Career Summit. Thing. And we were at Great American Pitch Fest, and we, our ships have passed. Yes. Any number of times. So this is actually the first time we're actually meeting, so to speak. Um, anyway, so thank you, Lee, so much. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. I can't wait to spend some time with you in person. That will be the next the next level of our relationship. Wonder. I look forward to it. And Bethan, as always, thanks for doing an amazing job and putting this all together. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Such a pleasure. Great to meet you. Have a great night. And thank all of our people for coming in the Hangout. Thank Thanks you. All your, all your people, and especially, I have to give a shout-out to Mike Doherty, who, uh, who showed up to support me yet again. I miss that, you. Thank you, Mike Doherty. <laughs>